Muhammad's destruction and annihilation, that filthy scum bastard, spiritual whore of the devil is burning in hell. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for destroying him. Save Muslims from this filthy dog. No disrespected dogs or filth or scum or bastards because they're better than Muhammad. All right, now, did you get the link, man? I just said it to you, man. Don't talk back to me, man. Don't give me a little service, okay? I'll tell you, man. I'll tell you, no, man. Look at you now. Okay? Look at you now, man. There, let's begin. Hold on, let me do this. Now we begin. Thank our brother. He doesn't get paid for doing this. He does it as an expression of his love for Jesus and the church. And at the same time, he helps to sanctify me by teaching me to be more patient. Okay, man? No, no, look at you, man. Okay, where's Pachanga, man? Where's Pachanga? You hear, man? Hello, hello. You hear, man? Can you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, man. Where's Pachanga, man? In Jesus' name, I keep the weight off. All right. Father, so spirit. All right, you ready, friend? Oh, Lordy, I hope so. Okay, I'm going to just give you the links there because we're not going to play any videos. What's up, Eric? How you doing? Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the links. Guys, all the articles, rebuttals that I'll be using in the session, description box, they're there for you. Upload them, study them, understand them, absorb them, use them to glorify Christ, right? It's yours, free. So I'm going to get you the links and then we'll begin. Here it is, link number one. Now, I'm going to probably have to do a part two because I already anticipate Protestants who hate communion of saints and think that we are contacting the dead are going to try to twist my words and use them against me. Because someone already tried to do that in my short clip on what our Lord Jesus said, the Father is greater than he. So here's that link, friend. That's yours. Okay. For those of you, here it is. It's the description box, but I'm going to put it up. And now you can bring it up for us, sir. Okay. Muhammad versus the Ten Commandments. Okay, man. Muhammad versus the Ten Commandments. Now, remember, there's going to be a 12-second delay. Because you counted, right? It was 12 seconds. I can't hear this guy now. See, you're already starting up again. Yeah, I'm all right. I was, uh, you counted, there, you said it was like a 12 second delay between when I say something, they see it here. Right. You're cool. Okay. So now, now if you want to large your screen, it's up to you, sir. You're cool, sir. Okay. We're going to unpack the meat of scripture, feast on the meat of scripture. And then at the same time, we're going to show how Muhammad broke all 10 commandments because he's under the feet of Jesus and he's burning in hell. Praise the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Hey, look what Christ's King just said. Man, you just made my day, homie. I was typing up on Google looking for a quote, St. Irenaeus, and I found your article with this quote out of nowhere. LOL, 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 lol. <laughs> All right. Now, what are the Ten Commandments? Now, we call them Ten Commandments or Ten Words. And the way you divide them into ten is actually arbitrary. Some divide the commandments differently, but they still end up with ten, right? So the ten words, they'll be divided differently, but it still results in ten, right? So there's nothing written in stone that this is how you divide them into ten. You can follow a different order as long as you end up with ten, right? Ten commandments or ten words. Now, what's the gist of the Ten Commandments, because before I show you how Muhammad violated these commandments, because he's a false prophet, antichrist, under the feet of Jesus Christ, right? And may the Lord Jesus save Muslims from this madman, this demon, this filth, sexual deviant. May the Lord Jesus keep us pure for his glory. Let's first read the Ten Commandments, and I'm going to tell you what these Ten Commandments were, what were the reasons why they were given as Holy Spirit loosens my tongue, and Holy Spirit, we beseech you and yield to you. Take over my mouth, the words of my mouth. Save me from error, stammering confusion. Bless Protestant I to work in perfect union by your power and illuminate us, Holy Spirit, with wisdom, knowledge, understanding, to know the word you inspired, to live it out passionately, to love your word, proclaim it out shame, and to destroy all wicked, filthy demons, antichrist like Muhammad, for the glory of Jesus and save Muslims out of the darkness of Islam, Save me from stammering, confusion, error. Bless the internet connection, the audiovisual qualities, and bring them, Holy Spirit. And use my voice to bless them. You're the teacher. We are your disciples. We yield to you. Take over our lives, the lives of our loved ones, my daughters and mother. Sanctify us for the glory of Jesus Christ. And strengthen my throat with the health and vigor I need. And my heart, arteries, lungs, and chest. 
and perfect self-control and self-discipline to never betray the Lord Jesus, but love Jesus Christ even unto death or until he returns. We need you, Spirit, take over in Jesus' name. Yehovah Rapha, Yehovah Rapha, Yehovah Rapha, Father, Father, Spirit. Even though Sargandi, I'll send him a link to his phone. I'll text him. Hey, I'm going live. He still needs to be notified by YouTube when to come and watch me, which means he doesn't even read my text messages, which means I need to block him on my phone. Thank you for exposing yourself. Now, let's read the Ten Commandments. You want to enlarge a little more? And we're going to read the Ten Commandments. Okay, let's read them to see what purpose they serve. Now, I notice, see, I got a typo again. May God save me from errors and mistakes and sin. God, I'm Shia, Father, so Spirit. All right, let's read. God spoke all these words saying, I am Yahweh, or Yahuwah, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol, nor any image of anything that is in the heavens above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow yourself down to them, nor serve them, for I, Yahweh, Yahuwah, your God, am a jealous God, <clears throat> visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, and showing loving kindness to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now watch these commandments. You shall not misuse the name of Yahweh, your God, for, if Yahweh, for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You shall labor six days and do all your work, <clears throat> but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh your God. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, strengthen my throat. Okay? You shall not do any work in it. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your livestock, nor your, your stranger, meaning the one who's not ethnically an Israelite, right? Who's within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land which Yahweh your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false witness. False wit witness. Bear false witness. Give false testimony. Bear false testimony. Right? Against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Now I want to read, continue. Here it is again. All the people perceive the thunderings, the lightnings, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they trembled and stayed at a distance. They said to Moses, speak with us yourself, and we will listen, but don't let God speak with us lest we die. The voice of God was too much for them to handle. It was too majestic and glorious for them to handle. And that's just his voice they heard audibly. They didn't even see him visibly. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid for God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you. Learn to fear God. So in fearing God, you won't cross the line and anger him. That you won't sin. <clears throat> the people stayed at a distance. And Moses came near to the thick darkness where God was. Yahweh said to Moses, this is what you shall tell the children of Israel. You yourselves have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. <clears throat> you shall most certainly not make gods of silver or gods of gold for yourselves to be alongside me. You shall not make an altar of earth for me and shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your cattle. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. If you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of cut stones. For if you lift up your tool on it, you have polluted it. You shall not go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness may not be exposed. And this is Exodus 20 verses 1 to 26. Then I give you the footnotes. Now skip because God then gave the commandments a second time. Right there. Stop right there. God then gave the commandment second time. Now, let me explain to you what God did. When he first brought them out of Egypt and they went into the wilderness at Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, God gave them these 10 <clears throat> words, 10 commandments the first time. 
But then 40 years later, right before Moses was about to die, God then reiterated, repeated these 10 commandments. And that's found in Deuteronomy chapter five. So God made known the 10 commandments on two occasions. At the beginning, where he brought them out of Egypt into the wilderness, where he brought them to Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, and came down visibly in front of the eyes of the nation in a pillar of cloud where they saw peals of lightning, smoke, fire, right? Thunder. They saw that cloud descend on the top on the top of Mount Sinai and Horeb. They didn't say, see God's visible form, but they heard God audibly speak from the cloud and they were terrified. But then 40 years later, right before Moses died, God had Moses reiterate, repeat, recollect, recall these 10 commandments and that's found in Deuteronomy 5. So let's read Deuteronomy 5, right? And by the way, if you guys don't know what Deuteronomy means, it comes from the Greek, duros, duros nomos. Those of you who speak Greek should know what that means. Duros nomos, duros nomos. Duros means, right, twice, second, nomos, the second law, the second giving of the law. Nomos means law, nomos. Duros, duros means second. So this is the second law, the second time the law was given. Right? Everyone got it? Okay, so now let's read Deuteronomy 5. Moses called to all Israel and said to them, Hear Israel, the statues and the ordinances. <clears throat> See again, saying the tax, but we rebuke him by the power of the holy blood of Jesus Christ. The Father, the Holy Spirit, shielding us. Strengthen my throat with health for your glory. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Here, Israel, the statues and the ordinance which I speak in your ears today, that you may learn them and observe to do them. Yahweh our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. <clears throat> Yahweh didn't make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive today. Because that first generation had died. If you want to know what's going on, 40 years later, that first generation that came out, all of them died with the exception of Caleb and Joshua. Aaron died, Miriam died. They all died except Joshua and Caleb and Moses is about to die. In other words, that first generation they came out with their children, none of them lived and entered the promised land with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. Now their children are grown because it's now 40 years later. So imagine you came out and you're eight years old. You're now 48 years old. So now God is telling Moses, tell that generation that were young children, now grown, their parents are all dead. Now this covenant is with them, not just their parents. Their parents have died. So now they're gonna enter the land at the hands of Joshua and Caleb, and they're going to be obligated to obey my commands. So far with me guys, before I move on. You guys got it <clears throat> so if you get it let's move on <clears throat> that's why it's saying this covenant is with us not just our ancestors it's with us this covenant's for us who are alive today Yahweh spoke with you because they were young at that time 40 years earlier face to face on the mountain out of the middle of the fire I stood between Yahweh and you at that time to show you Yahweh's word <clears throat> For you were afraid because of the fire and didn't go up unto the mountain saying, I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. <clears throat> you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make a carved image for yourself, any likeness of what is in heaven above or what is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow yourself, bow yourself down to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the third and on the fourth generation of those who hate me and showing loving kindness to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of Yahweh your God for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
as Yahweh your God commanded you. You shall labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh your God, in which you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your livestock, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt, and Yahweh your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahweh your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day, honor your father and your mother as Yahweh your God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land which Yahweh your God gives you. <clears throat> You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, neither shall you desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Yahweh spoke these words to all your assembly on the mountain out of the middle of the fire, of the cloud, and of the third darkness, with a great voice, he added no more. He wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. When you heard the voice out of the middle of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, behold, Yahweh our God has shown us his glory and his greatness. And we have heard his voice out of the middle of the fire. We have seen today that God does speak with man and he lives. So we've seen it, that God, if he wants to, will allow you to see him and not strike you dead, but allow you to hear his voice and see him visibly. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear Yahweh, our God's voice anymore, then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the middle of the fire as we have and live? Go near and hear all that Yahweh, our God, shall say and tell us all that Yahweh, our God, tells you and we will hear it and do it. Yahweh heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me. And Yahweh said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken to you. They have well said all that they have spoken. Oh, that they that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me. Oh, that they would always have this attitude, always have this disposition, always have this fear that it would go well with them. And wouldn't defy me, so I punished them, right? Oh, that there was such a heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Deuteronomy 5, verses 1 to 29. So now, understand what we just read. These are commands that God himself came down visibly in a cloud where they saw peals of lightning, heard thunder, smoke and fire and the cloud was dark they didn't see god's visible shape moses saw that when he entered the cloud but then they heard god speak audibly and they heard him audibly utter these commands now notice out of their fear what did they ask for pay attention out of their fear they said look we don't want to hear god's voice anymore you mediate for us you intercede for us you be the middleman and you know what god said good i like that they fear me I like that they now see and realize my glory and majesty and they're in awe of me. May they always have that fear and that attitude to know how real I am, how majestic I am, how glorious I am. And am I consuming fire so they don't sit against me, so I don't consume them, but bless them. And I will hear their words. I won't speak to them directly. I will raise up prophets like you to speak to them on my behalf because that's what they wanted. Guys got it? They didn't want God to appear to them. They wanted a mediator, an intercessor, a middleman. So they go, Moses, you mediate, you intercede, you be the go-between where you represent us to God and you speak on God's behalf to us because we don't want to hear him directly. We can't handle his voice. We want you to speak. And God says, okay. Susan, you're absolutely wrong, and I already anticipated this, you see? Susan is an illustration why I said 
I'm going to have to do a part two. And it's obvious Susan hasn't been listening to all my sessions or read my articles. Susan, on my YouTube channel, I have a playlist on veneration of the saints. You misunderstood the commands of God and you misunderstand communion of saints. But it's okay. She's new. She's not attacking. She's asking. You are wrong because what God is condemning here is worshiping creatures and objects as gods and goddesses alongside of God or in the place of God. I'll expound on that, but be patient, sister. Catholics, Orthodox, Coptic, Assyrian Church, and the early church, as far back as you can go from the earliest extent sources, the church would invoke the intercession of those who departed this world and were dwelling in the presence of our Lord, and I'll show you from scripture itself, God himself commissioned the fashioning of images. Be patient, sister. Most of my extended family are Catholics and bow down and pray in the statues of Mary and St. Shadow. Is this a sin? I love them dearly and pray they come to God's commands. Am I wrong? Yeah, it's not a sin. And I'll explain. I used to think it was a sin because I misunderstood these passages, but I trust the Holy Spirit to sanctify me and all of us and guide us into truth and save us from idolatry and blasphemy in Jesus name. I'll explain if you're patient, but I can't do several things at one time. Just be patient, sister. Okay. Now, before I get into the meat, I'm trying to teach you the depth of scripture. I'm trying to teach you by the power of the Holy Spirit using me to teach you because we're his disciples, the depth of scripture. So we can know our Bible and understand it properly. Okay. Now, let me show you what our Lord says are the greatest commandments and show you how the Ten Commandments comport with the teachings of our Lord Jesus. Brother, go to BibleGateway.com, open up Mark 12 and read 28 to 34. Okay. So guys, obviously I'm going to have to do a part two. Obviously, it's made it clear to me. I'm sorry, what do you want to open? Bible Gateway, sir. You already opened it. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm but, sorry. You seen the verses. I'm sorry. But, but, Can you... Sir, I'm not as fast as you. Patient, sir. You're cool, sir. Okay. Mark 12, 28 to 31. And enlarge your first. Okay. Now watch here. What does our Lord... Now you're going to understand what our Lord meant. And now understand why there are 613 commandments given through Moses. Pay attention, folks. Don't be distraction, distracted. Let the Holy Spirit speak through us. And may he guard my tongue from error. Then one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, <clears throat> perceiving that he had answered them well, asked them, which is the first commandment of all? Meaning, which is the foremost commandment, the greatest commandment, the most important of all commandments? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah, the Lord our God, Yahuwah is one. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. I thought I said Mark 12, 28 to 34. Is that what I said? Or you, yeah, yeah, you, you, you didn't hear me. Can you explain to me why didn't you hear me, sir? Sounded like 31. Yeah, it's always someone else's fault, right? No, I'm taking the blame. No, you're not. It's always Adam's fault. Him too. My, my ears, are, uh, you know, they're clogged up, dude. No, it's not. It's Hussein's fault, sir. But if Adam, Adam wants to be at fault, that's cool too. That'll be your scapegoat. Punish him for your sins. What's wrong with you, right? So let's look at 31 again. What does 31 say? And the second like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So Jesus said the greatest, the most important commandments are, there's only one God, the Lord our God, and we are to love him unconditionally, wholeheartedly, more than anything, more than our own selves, and love our neighbor as ourselves. Now watch, 32, 34. So the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth for there is one God. And there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, 
If these are the greatest commandments, what about the 10 commandments? Now, let me let you in on a little secret. Here's where you're going to see the wisdom of God, the beauty of God, and why our Bible is supernatural. Okay, what do I mean? Jesus, our Lord, just said the most important commandment is to love God unconditionally more than anything, more than yourself, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do you, are you aware that if you pay attention to the commandments, if you pay attention, if you're focusing by the power of the Holy Spirit as he gives us illumination, did you know that all 613 commandments serve the purpose of showing you how to love God and your neighbor? In other words, these commandments tell you how to go about proving your love for God if you love him and neighbor. That's all they are. In other words, all of the commandments are based on these two. Showing your love for God and showing your love for your neighbor. If you love God wholeheartedly, unconditionally, and you love your neighbor as yourself, then you won't do this, but you'll do this. In other words, this is how you're going to treat God, and you're going to avoid doing this, lest you anger God. And this is how you're going to treat your neighbor, and you're going to avoid, avoid doing this to your neighbor. All of the commandments are nothing but commentary explaining to you how to go about showing your love for God and neighbor. After all, if I love my neighbor, I won't covet his wife. If I love my neighbor, I won't slander him. If I love my neighbor, I won't covet his merchandise. If I love my neighbor, then I will honor my mother and father because my mother and father, they are my neighbors. And if I love God, I won't dishonor his name. If I love God, I won't worship any other God besides him. If I love God, I'll devote a day of rest where I just focus on him and not on my own selfish pursuits or personal gain. See, all of the commandments are nothing but a commentary showing you how to prove your love for God and neighbor. That's what it is. Everyone got it? That's what it is. Does it make sense now? If you actually, if you actually pay attention, 10 commandments, the first four commandments are about how to show your love for God. And the last six is about how to show your love for neighbor. If you love God, you're going to honor the Sabbath and devote a day where you just focus on him and glorify him and enjoy him. And if you love God, you won't worship any other gods. And if you love God, you won't misuse his name. And if you love your neighbor, then you're going to honor your mother and father. You won't slander your neighbor. You won't murder him. You won't sleep with his wife or sleep with his her husband. You won't. Be jealous of him, envious of him, and covet what he has. You see, now it makes sense, doesn't it? Now it makes sense, doesn't it? You see why Jesus said the greatest of all commandments is to love God unconditionally more than anything, more than yourself, and love your neighbor as yourself? Because if you actually pay attention to commandments, and don't take my word for it. Now when you read the law of Moses, focus on the commandments and how each commandment addresses how to show love for God or neighbor. Okay? So go to Matthew 7, 12. Open that up for us, brother. So without all, with that in the background, I want to show you how Muhammad violated all of these commandments. Okay? Matthew 7, 12. Watch here. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of the prophets. You see what he said? The law of the prophets are all summed up, are all summed up in one sentence. Do to your neighbor what you'd have him do to you. Treat your neighbor the way you'd have him treat you. The rest is commentary. See it? Now you know why God says, don't misuse my name. Don't have other gods beside me. Honor the Sabbath. Set it apart as a day where you focus on me and enjoy me and not on your own interests or selfish pursuits. And don't lust for your neighbor's spouse. And don't be jealous and envious of him. And don't lie against him. And don't slander him. And love your... Because 
This is the way you go about showing, not just in words, but in deeds, your love for your neighbor and God. Is that clear? Does it now all tie in and make sense? So making sense, folks? Okay, now I'll show you how Muhammad violated these commands. Don't want to move on until it sinks in. Because this is a class. I want you to learn. Learn your faith. Learn your Bible. Live it out for the glory of Christ. So now when you read the law, pay attention. When the law tells you something, note it will be in respect to showing love for your neighbor or God. <clears throat> That's what you see. For example, if your neighbor's donkey or animal falls in a ditch, take him out. Why? Because if you love your neighbor as yourself, if your beast of burden fell in a ditch, you'd want your neighbor to save your animal. Then do that for him. Don't steal. Because you don't want your neighbor to steal your merchant. You see how it works? It not all makes sense, doesn't it? It all ties in, right? If it ties in, now let's get to the meat of the matter. Now go back to my article, The Ten Commandments. Okay? I'm going to tell you what command we're going to look at, friend. Because it's long. We're going to start, I think, near the end. I'll tell you where. Right, friend? Just don't upset me, sir. Okay. If you upset me, then... I'm going to have you'll to be, hurt Adam Seeker. You'll be upset. I'll tell you where we're going to go. We're going to go to, uh, yeah, let's start with, it's a long one. Hold on, friend. Let's go to commandment where you'll see it says, Muhammad's covetousness, adultery, and sexual immorality. It's near the end of the paper. We're going to start with the near the end first and work our way up. Muhammad's covetousness, adultery, and sexual immorality. So it's commands 14 and 17. Commands 14 and 17. Okay. Okay, folks, we're not going to follow the order of my post. We're going to deal with all of them eventually. If not in one session, we'll do another session. The best way to do that would have been command F, don't you think? And then just put in the words and I took you there. Moments covetousness. What do you think? Mohammed's apostrophe S, yes, covetousness. COV. There you go. Fast, sir. Now, let's begin with this section. Now, guys, focus. Muhammad this broke all ten commandments. Commandments 14, well, not 14. Verses 14 and 17 from Exodus chapter 20. 14 and 17, Exodus chapter 20, right? You shall not commit adultery. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. That's in Exodus 20. It's verses 14 and 17. Did Muhammad violate these commands? Did he commit adultery? Did he covet his neighbor's wife? Yep, you better believe it. Everyone knows this. Muhammad lusted after his adopted son's wife causing his adopted son to divorce her so he could commit adultery with her. So let's read. Let's begin. Chapter 3337. This is based on 3337, right? So let's read what it says. And remember, when you said to him, Zayd bin Haditha, the freed slave of the Prophet, on whom Allah has bestowed grace by guiding him to Islam, and you, O Muhammad too, have done favor by manumitting him, these comments in parentheses brackets are supplied by Halali Khan. And Muhammad said to him, keep your wife to yourself and fear Allah. But you did hide in yourself, i.e. what Allah has already made known to you, that he will give her to you in marriage, that which Allah will make manifest. So you hid in yourself what Allah was about to reveal. Okay? You did fear the people, i.e. Muhammad married the divorced wife of his manumitted slave, whereas Allah had a better right that you should fear him. So when Zayd had accomplished his desire from her, we gave her to you in marriage so that in future there may be no difficulty to the believers in respect of the marriage of the wives of their adopted sons when the latter have no desire to keep them, i.e. they divorce them, and Allah's command must be fulfilled. Now explain what is it saying. Muhammad lusted for his daughter-in-law. Zayd ibn Haditha married Zainab bin Josh, Muhammad's cousin she didn't want to marry him and her brother didn't want her to marry Zayd 
Muhammad insisted they had no choice. Now, Zayd was adopted by Muhammad to be his son. Let me give you the background, and then I'm going to read to you the treachery. When Muhammad was hired by Khadija bin Khuwaylid, because she was a wealthy merchant woman, and Muhammad was hired by her to be her merchant, where he would go and buy and sell her goods, right? She had Zayd as her slave. When, ma when she married Muhammad, Zayd became Muhammad's slave. Now, according to the Muslim sources, guys, listen. According to the, Muhammad, to the Muslim sources, five years before Muhammad supposedly became a prophet, according to Muslim sources, at the age of 40, in the year 610 AD, Gabriel, who was none other than Satan appearing as Gabriel, convinced Muhammad he's a prophet. Five years before that, in 605 AD, Muhammad's slave, Zayd, his father and father's brother, Zayd's father and Zayd's father's brother, his uncle on his father's side had heard that Zayd was now living in Mecca because he had been kidnapped. He had been stolen and sold off as a slave. So when Zayd's father heard, he took his brother, Zayd's paternal uncle, headed to Mecca to ransom his son. So when they found Muhammad, they told him, we're here to ransom our son. How much do you ask for? Now, guys, listen, this is all the Muslim sources. Pay attention. Muhammad said, well, it's his decision. If he wants to go, he's free. According to the Muslim sources, Zayd refused to be free. He chose instead to remain Muhammad's slave because of the kindness and the mercy and love shown to him by Muhammad. Muhammad was so moved by that gesture, the Muslim sources say that Muhammad took Zayd in front of the Kaaba and announced to all the Arabs, from now on, Zayd is free. I emancipate him. He's no longer my slave. He is my son. I take him to be my son. I am his father. So in 605 AD, Zayd was called Zayd ibn Muhammad, son of Muhammad, not Zayd ibn Haditha. Fast forward years later, Muhammad is now in Medina. Now remember, he went to Medina around 622 AD. This is 605, right? 605, 622. Decades later, Muhammad now forces Zayd to marry Zayd. And then Muhammad goes to Zayd's house, sees Zainab unveiled, and starts lusting for her. Now let's read it. Here it is, the source. It's all in those, in those links. Now watch here. Only after some time, Zayd complained to the prophet regarding what he had suffered with Zainab. The prophet came to them and admonished here. Now there's a typo there, and that's not my fault. And while he talked to her, he admonished her. So he went to admonish her. And while he talked to her, he developed, right, likeness for her beauty, countenance, and wit. Now, these are the Muslim sources, guys. These are not Jews, Christians, Islamophobes. The Muslim sources say that when Muhammad saw Zainab unveiled, he started lusting for her. Notice, he developed likeness for her beauty, countenance, and wit. It happened as Allah decreed. Do you guys catch it? Allah had predestined that Muhammad would lust for her so that Muhammad would marry her. The Prophet then returned and had in his thought what Allah had will. Thereafter, the Prophet asked as to how had he been with her. He again complained about her. The Prophet said, fear Allah and keep your wife with you while he had in his heart something else. Do you see the dirty, filthy, adulterous deceiver? The Muslim sources are telling you that Muhammad was lusting for his daughter-in-law lusting for her in, her in his heart, but he was hiding it and telling Zayd, don't divorce her, stay with her, even though in his heart, he wanted the woman for himself. Then the prophet then came to Zayd and saw Zainab as she was standing. She was beautiful, fair complexion, and among the best women of Quraysh. Therefore, the prophet 
felt an inclination for her. And while leaving said, praise be to Allah who turns the hearts. And Zainab heard that. Subhanallah, glory be to Allah who turns hearts, meaning who moves hearts to lust, to desire women. Zayd discerned and said, O Messenger of Allah, allow me to divorce her, for she has haughtiness and is arrogant with me, and her language also hurts me. The Prophet said, Hold on to your wife and fear Allah. Zayd, however, eventually divorced her. Now, this comes from one of the oldest commentaries in the Quran, Muqattil bin Sulaiman al Tafsir, volume 3, pages 492 494. This is a Muslim source, one of the oldest Muslim con commentaries on the Quran. It's not Christian, it's not Jewish. Here's another one. According to Yunus bin Abdul Ala, Ibn Wahib, Ibn Zayyid, who said the messenger of God had married Zayyid bin Haritha to Zainab, Zainab bin Jash, his paternal aunt's daughter. In other words, his father's sister's daughter, his first cousin. One day, the messenger of God went out looking for Zayd. <clears throat> now there was a covering of hair cloth over the doorway, right? But the wind had lifted the covering so that the doorway was uncovered. Covered. Zaynab was in her chamber undressed. <whistles> and admiration for her entered the heart of the prophet. After that happened, she was made unattractive to the other man. Did you catch it? When Muhammad lusted for this married woman, Allah made Zayd, Zayd to no longer desire her. Who made Zainab unattractive to Zayd? Who caused Zayd to no longer desire her? Allah. Why? Because Allah made Muhammad lust for a married woman so he could have her. So he came and said, Messenger of God, I want to separate myself from my companion. Muhammad asked, what is wrong? Has anything on her part disquieted you? Now watch. No, by God, Allah, replied Zayd. Nothing she has done has disquieted me. She hasn't done anything to upset me, Messenger of God, nor have I seen anything but good. No, she's a good woman. The Messenger of God said to him, keep your wife to yourself and fear God. This is the meaning of the word of God. And when you said unto him on whom God has conferred favor and you have conferred favor, keep your wife to yourself and fear God. And you did hide in your mind, your heart, that which God was to bring to light. You did hide in your mind the thought that if he separates himself from her, I will marry her. Did you catch it? This is Al-Tabari. Jami al bayyin fi tafsir al-Quran. Volume 20, page 274. One of the greatest Muslim commentaries, historians who ever lived. And he admits, he admits that what Muhammad was thinking in his heart, in his mind, if he divorces her, I'm going to marry her. What do you mean? You guys catch it? Let me unpack this before we go any further. You guys catch it before I move on? What do you mean? Okay, now let me unpack this. The Muslim sources, the earliest, most reliable commentaries on the Quran, including Al Tabari, consider one of the greatest, and not the greatest, Muslim commentator, historian, admit Muhammad started lusting for his daughter in law, the wife of his adopted son, committing adultery in his heart, and thought to himself, that if Zayd divorces her, I'll marry her. So when Zayd was caused by Allah to no longer desire, because Allah made Zayd no longer desire Zayd, because Allah wanted Muhammad to marry Zayd, Zayd comes to Muhammad and says, I want to divorce her. Why? Anything bad from her? No, I see nothing but good. And Muhammad, because he was a coward and he had hid in his heart, his adulterous lust for his son's wife said, no, no, keep her. Don't divorce her because he's afraid of the backlash. Zayed divorced her anyway. 
Now, here's where it gets worse. Pay attention. Muhammad then marries her. And according to 3337, the reason why Muhammad married her, so he could set an example for other men that they too could marry the divorced wives of their adopted sons. So if I had adopted son and he's married and he divorced his wife and I found her attractive, I can then marry her, make her my wife, thereby making her now his stepmother. Tell me this is not a filthy, wicked, disgusting religion. Now do me a favor, can you open up the Quran browser? Because we got a lot to unpack. Quran browser if you can. It's gonna get worse guys, hold on. Oops. You thought this disgusting. That's not my Quran browser, so I don't know where you're going there. The one that we use for the website, do you know where it's at? Hold on a second. It's gonna get even worse guys. If you would just send it to me, please. Pens and needles. Needles and pens. Happy man. Is it my bad friends? What am I mad about? I've sent this link to Hussein Meshni about 10 million times, and I'm sending it to Protestant believer 5,000 At least times. three times. Yes, yes. And neither him nor Hussein save it in their favorites and use it, even though it's the browser that's part of our website. Were you predestined to exist to cause me to stumble, sir? You and Hussein and Adam? Okay. Let's see now. Maybe next week you can ask me for it again. Okay, friend? All right. Okay. All right, just do it. Now, can you want to enlarge it for me, sir? Because I don't, we don't wear glasses, sir. We can't see. A yeah. little more, if you can. All right, now, you can choose Arbery. Put 33, verse 6. 33, verse 6. Now, watch here, guys. Okay. The prophet is nearer to the believers than their selves, their souls. His wives are their mothers. So Muhammad's wives are their mothers. Now watch how disgusting is going to get. Those who are bound by blood are near to one another. The book of God, Allah, are near, the, near to one another. In the book of God, Allah, then the believers and the immigrants, nevertheless, you should act towards your friends honorably. That stands inscribed in the book. Did you catch what it said? Muhammad's wives are the spiritual mothers of believers. Now understand how disgusting this is going to get. Zayed was having sex with Zainab. A man, a woman that he had sex with, saw her naked. Now his adoptive father marries her. And now she becomes not only his spiritual mother, she becomes his stepmother. And now a woman that he saw naked and he had sex with, he now must view as his stepmother and spiritual mother. You guys catch how disgusting and filthy this religion is? Okay, now. It gets worse because Muhammad faced backlash and persecution and people insulting him, saying to him, you took your son's wife because Zayd used to be called Zayd ibn Haditha, Zayd ibn Muhammad. His father's name was Haditha, but then they started calling him Zayd ibn Muhammad as Holy Spirit enables me to call scriptures perfectly for the glory of Jesus Christ. Zayd Ibn Muhammad, Zayd son of Muhammad, Muhammad's father, because people started insulting him. You took your son's wife. Disgusting. Guess what Allah did? Guess what Allah did? Allah abolished, abrogated adoption. So that people would stop calling Zayd the son of Muhammad because he wasn't Muhammad's biological son. Do me a favor, go back to my browser again, but now use Hilari Khan, Hilari Khan. 33 verses four and five, comma, verse 40. 33 verses four and five, right? Comma, verse 40. Now watch here. 
According to all the Muslim scholars, Ibn Kathir Tabari, verses 4 and 5 were quote-unquote revealed to abolish adoption after people insulted Muhammad for stealing his son's wife. Here you go. Allah has not put for any man two hearts inside his body. Neither has he made your wives, whom you declare to be like your mother's backs, your real mothers, as zihar, is the saying of a husband to his wife, you are to me like the back of my mother, i.e. you are unlawful for me to approach. Nor has he made your adopted sons your real sons. This is but your saying with your mouths. Did you catch it? Your adopted sons are not your real sons. But Allah says the truth and he guides to the right way. Now watch. Call them, your adopted sons, by the names of their fathers. That is more just with Allah. But if you know not their father's names, if you don't know who their fathers are, right? Call them your brothers in faith. And mawalikum, mawalakum, 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 mawla, your freight slaves. And there is no sin on you if you make a mistake therein, except in regard to what your hearts deliberately intend. And Allah is ever off forgiving, more merciful. So Ibn Kathir, Tabari, they all say these verses were sent down after Muhammad was being ridiculed, insulted, attacked for stealing his son's wives. So Allah said, they are your adopted sons no more. They're not your real sons. Don't call them your sons. Name them after their, their fathers. If you don't know who their fathers are, then call them your brothers. I abolish adoption. And 3340 also came down. Watch here. 33 verse 40. Watch what it says. Muhammad is not the father of any man among you, but he is the messenger of Allah and the last of the prophets and Allah is ever all aware of everything. These verses came down, no more adoption. Your adopted sons are no longer your sons. Stop calling them your sons. Therefore, Zayd was no longer called the son of Muhammad, even though from the year 605 AD all the way into the 620s AD, he had called Muhammad his father, and Muhammad had called him his son, and he was called by the people, Zayd, son of Muhammad, he abolished adoption. Now we got problems. Are you ready to see what the problems are? Are you ready to see what the problems are? Didn't 33 verse 37 tell us? Open up 33, 37, we can, brother, one more time. Didn't 33, 37 tell us the reason why Allah made Muhammad lust for his daughter-in-law so that his son would divorce her so he could marry his daughter-in-law and have sex with her was to set precedence that he'd be an example. Hey, you adopted fathers, look at me. If your adopted sons divorce, you can have their wives and marry them. Here it is, the last part. So when Zayd had accomplished his desire for her, when Zayd was done ravishing her sexually, divorced her, we gave her to you in marriage. Why? So that in future, there may be no difficult, difficulty to the believers in respect of the marriage of the wives of their adopted sons when the latter have no desire to keep them, i.e. they've divorced them and Allah's command must be fulfilled. But I'm confused. Didn't Allah know he was going to abolish adoption? Remove adoption? So then how could Muhammad set precedence, be an example for other adoptive fathers to marry the divorced wives of their adopted sons when Allah knew he's going to abolish adoption, thereby destroying this example that Muhammad set? Because there would be no more adopted children whose wives you could then marry and sleep with. Did Allah know that? Especially if the Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah. If it's the uncreated speech of Allah, that means already in eternity, Allah knew he was going to abolish adoption. But he also knew he's going to make Muhammad lust for a married woman, make his adopted son no longer desire his wife, causing his adopted son to divorce her, so Muhammad could then have sex with her and ravish her. What's going on here, guys? What's going on here? How could Muhammad be an example for adopted fathers to marry the divorced wives of their adopted sons so they can have sex with them when Allah knew he's going to abolish adoption? So then why did Muhammad marry Zainab when Allah knew 
that there would be no more adoption so that Muhammad's precedence in marrying his adopted, adopted son's divorced wife would no longer be a fit example for anyone because no one afterwards could adopt anyone. See the problem? Before I move on? Let that sink in, guys. But hold on now. Because of Muhammad being wicked and filthy and wanting to save face after people started mocking him for lusting for his daughter-in-law and stealing his adopted son's wife, <clears throat> he ended up abolishing adoption. And because he ended up abolishing adoption, till this day in Muslim countries, you have children who have been orphaned. Either their parents died or they were abandoned in orphanages. And you have couples who cannot have children. Either the man can't get his wife pregnant or the woman is barren. And because of Muhammad and his God, they cannot adopt children and raise adopted children as their own. And orphans cannot be adopted and view people as their parents because adoption has been abolished by Muhammad and his God. Leaving couples without the hope of raising children as their own and orphans without the hope of calling anyone father or mother. Thanks to Muhammad and his God. Thanks to Muhammad and his God. You caught it? You understand what's going on here? So not only do we have Zayd having to view Zainab, a woman he saw naked and had sex with, as his spiritual mother and adoptive mother, stepmother, then adoption is abolished. So he still has to view this woman whom he saw naked and had sex with as a spiritual mother. Now, because of Muhammad, orphans cannot be adopted and therefore cannot call anyone father or mother. And couples who cannot have children of their own can never adopt and raise children as their own because of Muhammad and his God. You guys getting this? Come on, guys, help me out. Help me, help me out. Right? This is in contrast to the God revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. A God who loves to adopt. A God who has adopted you through faith in Jesus to be his sons and daughters. And because our God is a God who loves to adopt, he put in the hearts of Christians to adopt children and start orphanages with the hopes that Christians would adopt these children and love them as their own children. Open up the Bible, Galatians 4, verses 4 to 7, brother. Galatians 4, verses 4 to 7. Contrast this with the true God revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay. Galatians 4, verses 4 to 7. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, our blessed Lord Jesus, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Thank you, Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus. You are the true God, and all of the Quran is Satan. Okay? And because you are sons... God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Because of Jesus, we now have the Holy Spirit of the Father and the Son in our hearts who moves us and reassures us and convinces us God is your father and you can call him daddy. Abba, daddy, father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now go to Romans 8, 14. 18 Romans 8 14 to 18 see Romans 8 14 to 18 watch here for as many as are led by the Spirit of God these are the sons of God as many that are led right By the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, 
by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit, the eternal Spirit, the Holy Spirit of the Father and the Son, bears witness with our spirit, our inner person, convincing us and reassuring us that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now go to John 1, 12 to 13. John 12, 12 to 13. But as many as received him, as many as received Jesus Christ, our Lord, he, Jesus, gave the right to become children of God, not slaves, not orphans, children to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, let's see what Jesus says about Muhammad and his God. Allah caused Muhammad to lust for a married woman, and Allah caused Zayd to no longer desire his wife, forcing them to divorce. What does the true God say about Allah, Muhammad's God, and Muhammad? Matthew 5, 27 to 28, and 31, 32. Matthew 5, 27 to 28, and 31 to 32. Comma, 31, 32. Okay? Watch here. You have heard, this is Jesus, our Lord, speaking. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus said, if you lust for a married woman, you commit adultery. But Islam says, Allah caused Muhammad to lust for Zainab. Put that adulterous desire in Muhammad's heart. So Allah of Muhammad is Satan. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Now notice what Zayah did. He didn't divorce Zainab because she was sexually immoral. He divorced her because Allah wanted him to. When Muhammad then married her, he made her an adulteress and he was an adulterer. So the true God says, Muhammad, you are filth. You're an adulterer. You made Zainab an adulteress and Allah of Muhammad, you are Satan because you're the one who caused them to desire adultery. You caught it? Now let's go back to my article to that section again, All right? Because I want you to see something. Go back to my article because now it gets worse, guys. Watch what happens. It gets worse. Okay. Right? According to the Sunni Hadith, now look how bad it gets. The fouling passage was composed to justify jihadis like Muhammad's companions to rape married female captives and just female captives in general let's read also prohibited are women already married you cannot touch a married woman except the only married woman you can touch is who those whom your right hands possess thus hath god ordained against you except for these all others are lawful provided you seek them in marriage with gifts from your property desiring chastity not lust, seeing that ye derive benefit from them, give them their dowers at least as prescribed. But if after a dower is prescribed, agree mutually to vary it. There is no blame on you. God is all knowing, all wise. Now notice what it says at the top. Also prohibited, forbidden you are married women, except those your right hands possess. Meaning, if you take a married woman captive as booties of war, then that married woman, though her husband's alive, is lawful for you, can rape her and then sell her off. Now let's read the Hadiths to prove it. Look what the Hadiths say. Okay. Sahih Muslim, number 3371. Look what it says. Abu Surma said to Abu Sayyid al-Khudri, O Abu Sayyid, 
Do you hear Allah's Messenger mentioning Al Azal? Now, for those of you who don't know what Al Azal is, Al Azal is, it's coitus interruptus, meaning to pull out. What does it mean? Some of the Muslim men didn't want to get the woman that they took captive pregnant. So they wanted to know if they could pull out and spill their semen on the ground, right? So one man is asked, do you do al azin coitus interruptus? Do you pull out? Look how filthy and wicked and disgusting this religion is, the things they're talking about. Yes, and we and added, we went with Allah's messenger on the expedition to Bil Mustalik and took captive some excellent Arab women. And we desire them for we were suffering from the absence of our wives. But at the same time, we also desired ransom for them. So we wanted to take these female women captive and sell them back to their owners if they gave a ransom. But we wanted to rape them because they were beautiful. So we lusted for them. So watch, watch this, okay? We also desire ransom for them. So we decided to have sexual intercourse with them, but by observing Azam, withdrawing the male section organ before emission of semen to avoid conception. But we said, we are doing an act whereas Allah's messenger is amongst us. Why not ask him? So we asked Allah's messenger and he said, it does not matter if you do do it or do not do it. For every soul that is to be born up to the day of the resurrection will be born. It's up to you. You want to pull out, pull out. If not, don't worry about it. This is Islam. Now notice this one. This comes from Scroll down a little bit because I want to see if it's Sahih. Yep, it's Sunan Abu Dawood. Abu Sayyid Al Khudri said. Notice it's Sahih. Abu Sayyid Al Khudri said the Apostle of Allah sent a military expedition to Altas on the occasion of the Battle of Hunayn. They met their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captives. Some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah were reluctant. To have intercourse with the female captives in the presence of their husbands were unbelievers. See, they were like feeling ashamed. Wait, man, their husbands are alive. Their husbands are here. Do you really want to rape them? So Allah the Exalted set down the chronic verse, and all married women are forbidden unto you, save those captives whom your right hand possesses. So the verse came down saying, hey, don't worry about it. So what? Their husbands are alive. They're your property, your booty. You own them. Rape them. That is to say they're lawful for them when they complete their waiting period. Just first make sure they're not already pregnant so you know whose child she's carrying in case you have sex with them. What's the grade of this hadith? Sahih. Sunan Abu Dawood, volume 2, number 2150. Now click on the link so they can read it from sunnah.com. Taken directly from the Muslim website. Click on it. There it goes. Enlarge it so they can see it with their own eyes. You see it right there this is from the muslim i didn't make it up i'm not lying i'm not misquoting folks okay now let's contrast that contrast that with the law of moses the law of moses revealed 2200 years before muhammad go to deuteronomy 24 verses 1 of 4. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 of 4. Okay. Deuteronomy 20, 21, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 21, verses 10 of 14. Not Deuteronomy 24, 1 of 4. I'm sorry. That's divorce and remarriage. Deuteronomy 21, verses 10 of 14. Deuteronomy 21, 10 of 14. Here's God's true word. When you go out to war, because it's inevitable, people fight like the Russians, like this lady saying. So what Russia's raping? Last time I checked, Putin wasn't a messenger of Allah. When you go out to war against your enemies and Jehovah your God delivers them into your hand and you take them captive, ladies, watch this. And you see among the captives a beautiful woman and desire her and would take her for your wife. You don't rape her. You don't have sex with her and sell her off. Sonia, you must be one stupid Jezebel. You are one wicked, filthy Jezebel. If you're a Muslimah, you better call me now because I'm gonna make an example out of you. No one 
who claims to be a Christian will rape women. But you are stupider than your prophet Muhammad and you choose to justify Muhammad raping women, treating them like whores like you, which is why you're barking like a demon. Now let me now muzzle you, you filthy Jezebel, daughter of Satan. The Bible condemns anyone claiming to be a Christian to rape anyone. So if the Russians were really Christians, they wouldn't rape women and treat them as whores like Muslims treat you like a whore. Okay? So now, shut your mouth and listen before you get further embarrassed, you filthy Jezebel. There is no Christian who fears Jesus that rapes women. Your Muslims rape women. They rape you and your mother and treat you like whores. That's Islam. That's not Christianity. When you go out to war against your enemies and Jehovah your God delivers them into your hand and you take them captive. Okay. And you see among the captives a beautiful woman and desire her and would take her for your wife. Then you shall bring her home to your house. Now, guys, watch. And she shall shave her head and trim her nails. That's a sign of mourning. When you're mourning, you shave your head and you wear clothes signifying your mourning and put ashes on you. So you let her mourn. And this also serves as a deterrent. Why? Because when she shaves her head, she won't be attractive anymore. Right? A bald woman is not attractive unless you're like Jeremy Wong, a sickle. Just kidding. Anyway, not. She shall put off the clothes of her captivity, remain in her house, and mourn her father and her mother a full month. Notice she's not married because she can't be married. Okay? For a full month. Then what you do after that, you may go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. You can't rape her. You can't have sex with her immediately. Give her time to mourn. Shave her head. Give her a month because that will be a deterrent. If it's just lust, you don't touch her because she's going to turn you off. Then if you still desire her, marry her, honor her, and give her the status of a wife and treat her like a wife. And it shall be if you have no delight in her, then you shall set her free. But you certainly shall not sell her for money. You do not own her. She's not your property. You don't sell her. You let her go. You shall not treat her brutally because you have humbled her. This was given 2,200 years before Muhammad, that filth, and his God. There you go. And this is a command given during wartime. So if you have a so-called Christian soldier raping woman, he's no Christian. You see it? This command is still binding on Christians because this command relates to warfare. What if a Christian ends up in war? Well, that's how you treat captives. You don't rape captives and you don't take a woman who's captive and still married. If there's a captive who's not married, you marry her, honor her, exalt her. You get it now? Twenty, two hundred years before the filth of Islam. Everyone got it? Twenty-two years before the filth of Islam. Muhammad comes after Christ, and the Old Testament is not even on the same level of the New Testament. New Testament is superior to the Old Testament. And yet the Quran is not even as good as the Old Testament. Everyone got it? So what do we find? Muhammad was a rapist, an adulterer, a whore, and a whoremonger. And his God commanded, allowed, permitted his followers to be rapists, adulterers, whores, and whoremongers. It gets even worse. Let's go back to my post. It gets even worse. And thank Protestant for helping me help you. You got visual aid. You're seeing the verses with your own eyes. It gets even worse. Keep going. So I'll tell you when to stop. Here is proof that Allah is Satan. He's the devil because Allah makes you lust, makes you desire married women, right? Married husbands, 
makes you want to commit adultery and then makes you act on your adulterous desires. Don't believe me? Here you go. Sal Bukhari, volume 8, book 77, number 609. Sal Bukhari, volume 8, book 77, number 609. Read it with your own eyes. Narrated Ibn Abbas. I did not see anything so resembling minor sins as to what to Abu Huraira said from the Prophet who said, Allah has written for the son of Adam his inevitable share of adultery, whether he is aware of it or not. Wait, what has Allah written? What has Allah fixed and determined for all the children of Adam? Their inevitable, can't avoid it, share of adultery, whether he's aware of it or not. Allah has caused the adultery of the eye, which is looking at something which is sinful to look at. The adultery of the tongue, right? Which is to utter what is unlawful to utter. So Allah makes you say to a married woman or married man things to get them to want to have sex with you. And the adultery of the tongue, what is unlawful to utter, and the inner self wishes, your heart desiring and longing for adultery. And then Allah will make you act on that adultery by using your private parts. Your private parts turn that into reality or refrain from submitting to the temptation. How dare any Christian say that the God of Islam is your God? Now let's read the next hadith. How dare any Christian say the God of Islam is your God? Sai Muslim, book 33, number 6421. Verily, Allah has fixed the very portion of adultery which a man will indulge in and which he of necessity must commit. You got to do it. You have no choice but to do it because it's been fixed for you. You can't escape it or there would be no escape from it. Sai Muslim, book 33, number 6421. You caught it? It gets even more wicked and filthy. Allah also ordained and Shias believe it's still something that is allowed, even though Sunni say it's abrogated, Allah has ordained or had ordained if you're a Sunni. A man can go up to a woman and say, I want to marry you for an hour, for a day, for two days, for three days. And then when I'm done, I'll divorce you and give you money. Today, we call that treating a woman like a whore, prostituting women, which means that Allah and Muhammad were Arabian pimps, pimping women, treating women like whores, like prostitutes. Don't believe me? Let's read. Narrated Abdullah, and this is called temporary marriage, Zawaj al Mutah. Okay. Okay, watch here. You're shocked, huh? Even this man is shocked at the command God gave through Moses how humane. An attitude towards captive women. Historically, at that time where slaves were a normal, this teaching is absolutely incredible. You better believe it, friend. Oh, you like that one, huh? Caught it? Now, let's read. Sahib Bukhari, volume 6, book 60, number 139. You watch here. We used to participate in the holy wars. We used to participate in the holy wars carried on by the prophet. And we had no woman. We had no one to have sex with. So we said to the prophet, shall we castrate ourselves? See, look, Muhammad's God is so weak and impotent that he could not empower his jihadis to control their sexual urges. So what did Allah, Muhammad's God say? But the prophet forbade us to do that and thenceforth, he allowed us to marry a woman temporarily by giving her even a garment. And then he recited, oh, you believe, do not make unlawful the good things which Allah has made lawful for you. Did you catch it? Allah sent down chapter 5, verse 87 to license men to give women a garment or even dates to marry them for a short period of time, time to then ravish them sexually, to gratify their sexual lust and then divorce them and dump them, calling it. Pleasure marriage, temporary marriage, Sojan Muta. The next hadith. Narrator of Abdullah, we used to participate in the holy battles by Allah's apostle. We had nothing, no wives with us. 
So he said, shall we castrate ourselves? He forbade us that and then allowed us to marry women and temporary contract and recited to us, temporary contract. Oh, you believe, make not unlawful the good things which Allah has made lawful for you, but commit no transgression. Chapter 5, verse 87 again. Sahih Bukhari, volume 7, book 62, number 13.0. The other hadith, muta marriage involves a man hiring a woman for a specific amount of money for a certain period of time to have sex with her. The scholars agree that this muta marriage was authorized in the beginning of Islam. And he's a Sunni commentator, Al Razi. The Shia said, no, it's still binding on us. It is reported that when the Prophet came to Mecca to form Umrah, the women of Mecca dressed up and adorned themselves. Notice as he's performing the lesser pilgrimage, women are adorning themselves so that Muhammad and his Yahis could then marry them for a short period of time and treat them as whores and prostitutes. The companions complained to the Prophet that they had not had sex for a long time. So he said to them, enjoy these women. Al Razi, one of the greatest Muslim scholars, a Persian commentary of the Quran at Tafsir Al Kabir, chapter 4, verse 24. Enjoy them. Notice what he says here. Al Razi, look, notice what he says. No Muslim disputes that muta marriage was allowed in early Islam. Nobody. The difference is whether it has been abrogated or not. The only debate now among Sunnis is, has it been abrogated or is it still binding? But all of them agree that Muhammad allowed women to be treated as whores, prostituted and raped. You caught it? Now I'm gonna read some more hadith that say that muta was even being observed. Prostitution was even being observed, right? Big man, do you have guts to Skype me so I can use Numbers 31, 15, 18 to bury your Muhammad and piss on him? So I can read Numbers 31, 15, 18 in context to show you are a filthy pervert, a spiritual whore like your prophet Muhammad? Skype me, big man. I'm going to make you a little girl. I'm going to make you play with your dolls like Aisha played with her dolls. But Muhammad molested and raped her. I will bury you in Numbers 31, 17, 18. Come on, you filthy stone-licking whore. Call me on Skype so I can piss on your prophet, destroy your prophet, that filthy whore who's burning in hell. Thank you, Lord Jesus. But you have no honor because Muhammad treated your mother, your wife and sister as whores, and here you are defending him because you are a bastard like Muhammad. Skype me, big man. Let's see if you can refute me on Numbers 3115. But you're a spiritual whore like your prophet, little girl. No, I'm not hurt. I want to bury your prophet and piss on him. Ouch, Muhammad is butthurt in paradise where he's being raped by all the genies on Muhammad. Glory to Jesus. <laughs> but you're less of a man than Aisha. You won't Skype me, you filthy dog. See that? Instead of being jealous for his mother and his wife and sister, he'd rather justify Muhammad treating his mother as a whore and raping her in the name of Allah by misquoting the Bible, you filthy demon, you have no honor. You should be in jail because you're dangerous. You filthy whore like Muhammad. Praise the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This is Islam for you folks. Defending Muhammad, raping women, treating women as whores. So that means if his mother was there at the time of Muhammad, he'd be okay. The Muhammad and his guys rape her or treat her as a whore because he has no respect for his mother. You filth. You're dangerous. This is why you need to be thrown in jail. But sadly, the West allows you demons, you dogs to come in because this is their judgment for not following Jesus. Okay. Anyway, let now let's read the hadith that say that Muta was being observed even up until the caliphate of Uth Umar, not Uthman, Umar, Umar ibn al-Khattab. Let's read. Narid Abu Jamra, Sahib Bukhari, volume 7, number 51. I heard Ibn Abbas giving a verdict that when he was asked about the muta with the woman and he permitted it, nikah al muta, on that a freed slave of his said to him, that is only when it is very badly needed and women are scarce. Did you catch it? Muta is still allowed when it's badly needed and there's not enough women. On that, Ibn Abbas said, yes, 
And this is after the death of Muhammad. Next hadith. Ibn Uraj reported, Ati reported that Jabir bin Abdullah came to perform Umrah and we came to his abode and the people asked him about different things and they made a mention of temporary marriage. Whereupon he said, yes, we had been benefiting ourselves by this temporary marriage during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet and during the time of Abu Bakr and Umar. Did you catch it? Long after Muhammad dies, they're admitting we were treating women as whores, prostitutes, like big man's mother was being treated as a whore and prostitute, right? Up until Umar, long after Muhammad's death. Sai Muslim Book 8, number 3248. Again, Sai Muslim Book 8, number 3250. Abu Nadra reported, while I was in the company of Jabir bin Abdullah, a person came to him and said that Ibn Abbas and Ibn Zubair differed on the two types of muta. The matu of hajj, the muta that you do during hajj, when you perform hajj, and tamatu with women, just muta in general. Whereupon Jabir said, we used to do these two, both tr treating women as whores when we would do hajj, and treating, treating women as whores all other times, right? We used to do these two during the lifetime of Allah's messenger, and who stopped it? Umar, not Muhammad then forbade us to do them, and so we did not revert to them. Next hadith, brother. Urwa bin Zubair reported that Abdullah bin Zubair stood up and delivered an address in Mecca saying, Allah has made blind the hearts of some people as he has deprived them of eyesight that they give religious verdict in favor of temporary marriage. While he was alluding to a person, Ibn Abbas, he was insulting Ibn Abbas because Ibn Abbas, Muhammad's first cousin, allowed muta treating women like whores ibn abbas called him and said you are an uncouth person devoid of sense sense by my life muta this is ibn abbas muhammad's first cousin when muhammad prayed allah would give him wisdom of the quran muta was practiced when ibn abbas during the lifetime of the leader of the pious he meant allah's messenger and ibn zubair said to him just do it yourselves, and by Allah, if you do that, I will stone you with your stones. <laughs> Ibn Shihab said, <clears throat> Khalid bin Muhajir bin Saifullah informed me while I was sitting in the company of a person. A person came to him and he asked for a religious verdict about Muta, and he permitted him to do it. Ibn Abu Amra al Ansari said to him, Be gentle. It was permitted in the early days of Islam for one who was driven to it under the stress of necessity. Because you're too horny, you can't control yourself because your God can't help you control your horniness. Just as the eating of carrion and blood and flesh of swine, and then Allah intensified the commandments of religion and prohibited it altogether. Ibn Shihab reported, Rabbi bin Sabra told me that his father Sabra said, I contracted temporary marriage with a woman of Banu Amr, for two cloaks, guys, you see how filthy Muhammad and his God happened to be? He paid a woman two cloaks, gave her two cloaks during Muhammad's lifetime to marry her temporarily and divorce her. So what did he pay her to be his or Two cloaks. And he forbade us to do muta. Ibn Shiyab said, I heard Rabbi bin Sabra narrating it to Omar bin Abdul Aziz, and I was sitting there. Now, if this wasn't wicked and filthy enough, did you know that women got pregnant during muta and they conceived children born as a result of prostitution? Did you know that the Muslim sources admit that when men treated women like big man's mother and sister as whores and prostituted them as whores, marrying them for a short time, a day, an hour, two, three days, you name it, and paying them dates or cloaks, right? Some of them got pregnant with children. Here's an example. Malik's Muwatta, book 28, number 28.18.42. Yahya related to me from Malik, from Ibn Shihab, from Urwa Ibn Al-Zubair, that Khawla Ibn Hakim, Hakim, came to Umar ibn al-Khattab and said, Rabia ibn Umayyah made a temporary marriage with a woman 
and she is pregnant by him. Omar ibn al-Khattab went out in dismay, dragging his boat, saying, this temporary marriage, had I come across it, I would have ordered stoning and done away with it. So they were still doing it at the time of Omar, and a woman got pregnant. So many Muslims were born as a result of their mother being whored, being prostituted, being treated as whores and prostitutes, where a Muslim man said, I'm going to marry you for three days, two days, one day, an hour, and I'll give you dates or cloaks. And when I'm done, I'll divorce you. Sure, ravished her, defiled her sexually as a piece of meat. She got pregnant and gave birth to his child. This is Islam. This is Islam. You caught it? You see it? Now women, how many of you would willfully, gladly have sex with a jihadi who takes you captive how many of you will willfully, gladly have sex with a jihadi who takes you captive and your husband's still alive? And how many of you would willfully, gladly, if you are moral women, sane women, agree to any man, not just a Muslim, marrying you for three days and divorcing you and giving you a sum of money for your services? This is Islam. This is what we're up against in the West. These are what Muslims are going to do to us unless and until Jesus returns. This is why big man has no honor. He's filth, he's dirt, he's scum, he's a dog that he would actually try to defend his filth Muhammad for treating his mother as a prostitute, as a whore. And if his mother was living at that time and she was an unbeliever, he'd be okay with the jihadis raping her with his father still alive because this is what Islam does to you. And then misquoting Numbers 31, 17, 18, which if he was mad enough to call me, I will bury him because he didn't read the context because he's a filthy dog like Muhammad. You see why I have no respect for these jihadis, no respect for these Muhammadans who would defend this and attack the Bible and pervert the Bible to make the Bible sound like they're filthy dog Muhammad. No disrespect to filth and dogs. They're cleaner than Muhammad and his God. You see why they hate us and want to murder us? Because they can't silence us otherwise. Let's see if this dog Skype me. I hope he did. So I can take him online and bury him. Let's see. He knows better. Because he's not read number 31 in context. That's what I thought. No Skype from the dog. You have no honor. No decency. That you would justify what your prophet did to women. None. None, right? But we're gonna now go out with a bang. You know I'm gonna do part two, right? This is going to maybe be at least three parts because I got too much to cover, but we're gonna go out with a bang. This was just one section of my article. No, I'm Assyrian, a son of Ashur, Aturaya. Okay, now here it is. I'm gonna give you the article, we're gonna open it up. You thought Muhammad couldn't get any more filthier? Okay. You thought Muhammad couldn't get any more filthier? Okay, there you go. Muhammad's sexual privileges, based on chapter 33, verses 50 to 51. Here's the link, guys. And here's it for you, bro. You can post it for us. And we're going to open up. We're going to wrap it up. Thank you, bro, for helping me help you, brother. Let me know what your schedule like this week. If you're busy, understand. If you're free. Because there's some things I want to do. If not, that's okay, brother. I understand. Okay. Okay. After the show, uh, talk to me. All right. Here it is. Here's the link. I just gave it to you. I'll put it uh, in the comments with the other articles and put it in the description box. According to Al Qurtubi, Al Qurtubi, another renowned Muslim commentator, when Muslims want to exegete the Quran, they'll go to Al Tabari. They'll go to Al Qurtubi. They'll go to Al Zamakhshari, Baidawi, Ibn Kathir, the two Jalals, Al Jalalain, and Razi. I'm not exaggerating. The greatest Muslim expositors, according to Sunni Muslims, 
are Al Tabari, Al Kurtubi, Ibn Kathir, Al Jalalain, the two Jalals, right? Zamakhshari, Al Baidawi. You must read them to understand the Quran. So here's Al Qurtubi. Muhammad was given 16 privileges. No one else was given. Now, those of you who can read Arabic, I provided the Arabic and praise the Lord Jesus for a brother who translated the Arabic in English. There's the Arabic. I'm just going to mention some of Muhammad's 16 privileges. Not all, some. Okay, scroll down. Watch here. Here it is. Some, not all. Watch how many of the privileges are of a sexual nature. How many of these privileges have to do with Muhammad being a sexual pervert, a deviant, okay? A sexual maniac, notice, okay? Watch here, let's read. And any believing woman who dedicates herself to the prophet, scroll up a little bit, because I think you went too far down. Scroll up a little more. Okay, stop there, okay, sorry, just wanna make sure. And any believing woman who dedicates herself to the prophet, this is his exposition of chapter 33, verses 50 to 51. Right? If any woman dedicates herself to the prophet, if the prophet wishes to wed her, the word is nikah. It's not wed. It, now, let me explain what this is saying. This only for you, Muhammad, and not for the believers at large. A woman cannot gift herself to any Muslim man for sex. Okay? For sex. Except Muhammad. This is a Bible study, Snow Angel. I'm showing you how. God's true word, the Holy Bible, the Ten Commandments condemn Muhammad and Allah to hell, showing that Allah of Muhammad is Satan. So learn your faith. Nikah means to F someone. So what the Quran is saying is that if a woman voluntarily gives herself for Muhammad to F her, then this is a privilege for you, Muhammad, no one else. Because if a woman were to do that, you are to kill her. But for you, if a woman says, Muhammad, have me, ravish me, F me. You can take her. A privilege only for you. So now look what Qurtubi says. As for what was granted and made lawful to the Prophet, there are 16 issues. He was given 16 privileges, only him, no one else. I'm not going to mention all of them. I'm going to mention those that are important to show you what a filthy sexual deviant he was. Second, second privilege. To forcefully take a fifth of a fifth or just the fifth of the spoils of war. So when he sends his jihadis to murder and rape and loot, automatically a fifth of their plunder goes to Muhammad. Fourth privilege, to take more than four women. He could have up to 11 wives. Everyone else could only have four. Fifth privilege, watch what the Arabic word is. To marry, yastanki, literally not marry. To F a woman, who verbally pronounces her dedication to the prophet. So a woman says, F me Muhammad, he can F her. Only for him guys, notice this is a privilege for him. Someone else does it, will be killed. Sixth privilege, to marry or to F, yastanki, without the presence or permission of a legal guardian. In Islam, you must get the permission of the woman's legal guardian to marry her, not Muhammad. A woman can bypass her eagle, legal guardian guardian her mahram and just come to mom and say muhammad f me and the legal guardian says oh yes rasulallah for you she doesn't need to get my permission the seventh privilege to f mary yastanki without a dowry because in marriage you have to pay a dowry right you muhammad when you get married you don't have to pay a dowry and if you want to f someone you don't pay them anything eighth privilege to marry and have intercourse, F, during a state of ritual consecration purification. Everyone else can't do that. The ninth privilege, the annulment of an oath he may make to his wives. Lord willing, in part two, I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about this not now. Now watch the tenth privilege, guys, and get sick and vomit. This has to do with Zayed. Tenth privilege. This is in the Arabic. Qurtubi, we're not making it up. This is what the Muslim sources teach. If Muhammad looks at a woman, he looks at a woman and desires her, then it is necessary for her husband to divorce her and for Muhammad to marry her. 
Let me repeat two more times. A privilege that Allah gave Muhammad, according to Qurtubi, give it to no one else. If Muhammad looks at a woman and desires her, then it is necessary for her husband to divorce her and for Muhammad to marry her. You got to give up your wife for Momo. Ibn al-Arabi said, this is what the servant of the two holy mosques, the one who's in charge of the mosques in Medina and Mecca, has also said, as was clear to the scholars from the story of Zayyid, which also had this meaning. Did you catch it? Where did they get this from? Muhammad lusted for Zayyid's wife and Zayyid had to divorce her. 11 privilege. The Prophet released Safiya from her captured status and he considered her lace as her dowry. Now let me explain who Safiya is. She was a teenage girl whose family and husband were murdered. Right? Muhammad attacked this Jewish settlement, murdered her husband and her family. And then according to the Muslim sources, Dihya al-Kalbi took her as booty and wanted to rape her. Muhammad was told, look, Muhammad, Safiya is beautiful. She was a Jewish woman and she was the wife of the leader, Kinana, who was tortured and murdered. She belongs to you. Guess what the Hadith say, folks? Muhammad went to Dihya al-Kalbi, says, look, I will give you seven slaves for her. Sure. So notice, not only does Muhammad encourage and sanction slavery, enslaving people, he gave up seven slaves. He gave Dihya al-Kalbi seven slaves to own for Safiya, so he could marry her and ravish her. You got it? You understand what happened? And instead of giving her, right, a ransom, because you got to ransom slaves, it says, I'm sorry, Instead of giving her a dowry, my, my, I'm sorry, not ransom. Instead of giving a dowry, because when you marry a woman, you have to give her a dowry, a sum of money. Her ransom for seven slaves was her dowry. Her ransom for seven slaves, giving Dihya seven slaves to take her to be his wife was her ransom. So he said to her, if you marry me, I will ransom you. You won't be a slave, you'll be my wife. So he gave Dihya al-Kalbi seven slaves so he could release her to Muhammad. And Muhammad said, I will release you and won't make you my concubine, but my wife, if you agree to it. And by releasing you, that's your dowry. You guys got it? Twelve, to enter Mecca without being in a state of ritual purification. 13th, to fight in Mecca. It was forbidden to fight in Mecca. 14th, watch here. Look how sick this guy is. That he is not inherited by anyone at all. This is mentioned in the oath of absolution. For when a man approaches death due to illness, most of his possessions are taken away so that he does not have more than a third left for him. So the Quran says, and they say that you must make a will and leave your heirs your inheritance. Muhammad was freed from that obligation a hypocrite who did not practice what he preached but the possessions of the prophet remain for him as is evidence in the verse of inheritance in surat al maryam 15 now watch this if this doesn't make you hate this demon hate him worse than hitler and anyone else 15th privilege his marriage is still considered effective after his death did you guys know that according to the quran and the hadith muhammad's widows could not remarry because they were still muhammad's wives though he was dead you know that means that means he left aisha who was 18 when he died safia who was in her early 20s when he died and the other women who were all in their 20s widows for years after that where they could not marry anyone and have children because Muhammad's God said they're off limits, even when he's dead,
They're still his wives. You cannot marry them and touch them. So he left many of these women, widows, without children, without having a husband to be intimate with for many more years after his death. Because in the case of Aisha, she lived up to her 60s. See that? See what a wicked, filthy demon he was? Finally, 16, if he divorces a woman, she remains prohibited to any, everyone and may not be married. Nikah to someone else. You can't marry them. You can't F them. Did you catch it? You catch it even if he divorces her. You caught it? Not only if he dies, still marry. His widows, off limits. If he divorces a woman, you can't marry her or F her. Now, what does the word yastanki mean? Yastanki, this is kurtubi, comes from the word yanka, for the said in different forms, nakaha and yastankaha, just as it is said, ajab and istajab, istajab, ajab, istajab. So he's telling you, yastanki is simply another form, right, of nikah. Yastanki comes from yaka, from nikah, nakaha, to F her. So did you catch it? Muhammad's widows who were still married to him when he died, off limits. Women that Muhammad divorced, off limits. You can't marry them or F them. F them. Now let's read the next reference. Here's another one that I quote. This comes from, go all the way down, so we can see who it comes from. Right here. Do I have to tell you go all the way down again, brother? Brain freeze? Comes from, no, hold on. Nur al-Din al-Halabi. Nur al-Din al-Halabi. Al-Sira al-Sira al-Halabiya. Nur al-Din al-Halabi. Al-Sira al-Halabiya. Volume 3, page 419. Now let's read it. Go back and let's read it. So you can so. Al-Sira al-Halabiya. Okay, let's read it. Another Muslim scholar who confirms what we read from Qurtubi and we're wrapping it up. And from the third part, the privileges of Muhammad, it is permissible for Muhammad to kiss during the fast in front of witnesses. Because Muhammad used to kiss Aisha while he was fasting and sucked her tongue. Even though during fast you can't touch a woman, Muhammad could suck the tongue of his child bride while he's fasting. What a dirty pervert. French kisser. And it may be that Muhammad did not swallow her saliva. You see how sick these demons are? Well, you know what? He didn't swallow her uh, saliva at least. He licked and sucked her tongue, but he didn't swallow her saliva. <clears throat> and it may be that he did not swallow right and you know did not swallow saliva which was united with hers and it is permissible for Muhammad to be alone with a foreign woman and if he desired a woman who is single it is then permissible for him to go into her to have sexual intercourse without telling her that he wants to have sexual intercourse you catch it if he likes a woman he can go and jump her and mount her pretty much rape her without telling her he wants to have sex with her read it again he, if he desires a woman who is single, it is then permissible for him to go into her to have sexual intercourse without telling her that he wants to have sexual intercourse without a gift, without giving her a dowry, without her garden's permission, without witnesses. He can mount and rape her. She has to be okay with it. Just as in the case of who, look at the example, of Zainab bin Jaj, which has been mentioned, whom he took against her will. This is a Muslim source, Al-Sira al halabiya He took against her will. And if he desired a married woman, then her husband must divorce her and give her to him. What? If he desired a married woman, then her husband must divorce her and give her to him. What did you say? Sira al halabiya If he desired a married woman, then her husband must divorce her and give her to him. And if he desired a slave woman, then her master must give her to him. So if I own a slave woman, give her up. And he can marry away a woman whom he wants against her will. So if he wants you to marry that guy, you ain't got no choice. And he can marry in ihram, state of ritual purity, which happened when he had sexual intercourse with Maimuna, which has been mentioned. And he can take whatever woman slave he desires <clears throat> and other things even before the spoils of war have been divided. What more proof do you that you want that Muhammad broke the Ten Commandments, and according to the true God revealed in Jesus, and the true law of the true God revealed through Moses, 
Muhammad is an adulterer, a whore, a rapist, and a murderer who coveted his neighbor's wives, who committed adultery, who allowed others to commit adultery, who raped women and raped married women in the name of his God, all of which is condemned by the God of Moses and the God revealed in Jesus. And this is just part one. And I haven't listed the rest. Lord Jesus willing, more to come in part two sometime this week. We'll see as the spirit leads. Now you see why Muslims hate us, want to murder us, and you see what will happen to you if Jesus doesn't check Islam from spreading like cancer, like gangrene. When they become numerous, they're going to rape your women, rape your children, enslave you, and behead you. But in Jesus' name, who's alive, Muhammad is dead, buried in hell. He will destroy Islam and save Muslims and protect us in Jesus' almighty name. There you go. We're done.